Right, if you'd join me, please, in Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ. The books that we're holding, either physically or digitally, uh, are your very words. They're inerrant, they're inspired, they're infallible. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will never pass away. So we can and should build our life on these words, and we're thankful that you've recorded them through faithful men and you've preserved them for us. And now we ask that you'd give us the gift of teaching that we would understand and apply them to our own lives, our own hearts. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you pour out your spirit upon us. Holy Spirit, please give strength to our eyes, to our ears, to our minds, and in my case, to our tongue, that that which we consider this morning would glorify Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last time, in the first part of chapter 3, we considered having no confidence in our flesh and counting all things loss, which means a detriment to, counting all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now moving forward, uh, we're consider uh, pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ as citizens of heaven. So we got as far as verse 11 last week. We pick it up, verse 12, Philippians chapter 3. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. So Paul has no confidence in his flesh. He counts all things a detriment to subservient to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he is acknowledging here that he hasn't attained, he hasn't arrived, he's not a finished work, he hasn't reached full maturity in Jesus Christ, but he declares that he is pursuing that for which he was seized. And that happened on the road to Damascus. And what he was seized with was the plan and the purpose of God for his life. And as you mentioned in 2 Timothy, he's imploring Timothy to do the very same thing, to to pursue the plan and the purpose that God had for his life. He is saying that I'm doing that very same thing. When he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was led, of course, to Damascus. He was blinded. The Lord appeared to a faithful servant named Ananias and said, I want you to go over here and see this guy. Lord, are you sure? We've heard a lot about this guy. He's killing your people. And the Lord responded to him by saying, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And he would then have personal conversations with Paul. Paul would be in Arabia for three years. Jesus pouring his heart, his mind, his word into Paul, just like he had the other disciples. And when he stood before King Agrippa giving giving his personal testimony, he said that the purpose of his life, that God put on his life, was to open the eyes of the Gentiles, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, the faith of Christ, the faith that is in Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith, of which we are given a measure. Uh, And so what he is saying here is he is doing exactly as he had exhorted Timothy to do in the first letter. uh, In 1 Timothy chapter 6, he exhorted Timothy to follow after, meaning to pursue, to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold seize of eternal life unto that which you are called. And he would give him an exhortation in the second letter as well. Because Paul knows what's still going on in his life is that good work that God has started 
God will be faithful to finish it. But he's not done yet. And that which God has worked in, he is working out. But he's not done yet. So you might put it another way when Paul is saying to us here is that when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me to his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision the Lord Jesus Christ seized me apprehended me for his purpose and he's not done the purpose is not completed and so I continue to pursue the plan of God and the purpose of God in my life. Therefore, in verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto these things, those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Knowing that the Lord still had much to do in Paul. He still had much to do through Paul. Paul is laser focused on the finish line. And he's going to do these three things captured in these two verses. First of all, he's going to forget his long list of failures that are in the rearview mirror. He's going to ask the Lord to purge his mind of those things that he, the Lord, has already chosen to forget. For example, persecuting the church. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you persecuted. He was making all sorts of trouble for the early church. He was calling people into court. He was throwing them to prison. He was having some killed. He was zealous in his persecution of the church. And the devil would whipsaw him with that, no doubt, would beat him over the head with the things that he had done. But, Scripture says in Isaiah 43, verse 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. By faith. Paul is grasping onto the word of God and says, I am going to forget what is behind me because the Lord has chosen to forget those things. Which tells me, Paul's no different than than any of us. Have you suddenly been knocked down in your faith with the Lord by like a, a storm surge of painful and grieving and condemning and maybe even embarrassing memories of things that you've done in your past, things you've said in the past, whether it was when you were dead in your sins or alive to God, it doesn't matter. We stumble and we fall. Uh, And who brings those things to our memories? The devil. He's a slanderer. He's a liar. He's trying to destroy us. He says things to us that the Lord would never say. And his motive is to get us to stop or to get us to retreat or go to the left or go to the right. It happens to me. I know it happens to you. We have to understand where did that come from? Okay, that's the devil. Uh, Lord, Take that out of my mind. It is behind me. It's in the rearview mirror. You've chosen to forget. Help me to forget again. And then keep moving forward. Paul doing the same thing. Forgetting those things which are behind. And then, number two, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Marching toward what is in the future. What's in the future? Heaven, (laughs) then the kingdom of God on earth, then the new earth and the new heaven, eternal with God. That's what's before us. And as you said, the the sufferings of this, this light affliction can't compare with the glory that awaits us. So how do we trudge our way through to what's before? Well, sometimes we sing. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord. 
let it be. Songs, music, very important in drawing us closer to the Lord. Uh, Paul is saying here, I think we can all identify, you know, I'm not the person I was. Nor am I yet the person that I'm going to end up being. The Lord has worked salvation in. He is working purification out step by step, day by day. Got to keep my focus. And so he is choosing, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, and pressing forward to the goal. We are in these tents from dust that return to the dust. It's like to dust. It's like we're on probation here. Yes, uh, this is not our home. Yes, we are strangers and pilgrims. Yes, it's getting stranger all the time. We're on probation, but there's a goal. There's a prize. What's the prize? A glorified body. When do we get the glorified body? At the finish line. What do we hear at the finish line? Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. No sweeter words will ever be spoken to all of us at the finish line. The, sometimes we talked about this a little bit on, on Wednesday night in Numbers chapter 11. Sometimes we think the good old days are in the rear view mirror. They're not. They're up ahead. None of us have reached the good old days yet. So forget about the things that are in the past. Move forward to the things that are ahead and keep focus on the prize. No matter what the world does or says, no matter what the devil does or says, don't stop. Don't retreat. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Just keep marching forward with focus and that is exactly what Paul did in the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy he would he would write to Timothy as an as a, as a testimony but also as an encouragement to Timothy for now I am ready to be offered in chapter 4 and the time of my departure is at hand I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Which would include Timothy, which includes all of us. Paul had laser focus. He's encouraging us to have the very same thing. Verse 15 let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. He is encouraging the church at Philippi. He's encouraging us to be as focused as he is on the prize. Uh, he wants us to be like-minded as he is in job one. Job one, forgetting the things that are behind, reaching for the things that are before, and pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And as we pursue God's plan and purpose for our lives and are focused on the prize as we follow Jesus, and maturing in our relationship with Jesus day by day, situation by situation, trial by trial, temptation by temptation, we're being encouraged to walk together in one accord, in unity. Always the issue with the church in Paul's writings, always an issue to the church to this day is unity. Unity. And so to the extent, what Paul is saying is to the extent or to the degree that we have seized that for which we had been seized, seized, to the degree that we have seized onto God's plan and purpose for our lives, let's not look over our shoulder at things that are 
in the past, so many failures, so many failings, so many, so much grief. Don't look at that. Look forward. Keep your eyes on the finish line. And if you think differently, well, then God will reveal this wisdom to you. I'm not going to argue with you. See, none of us have arrived. The manufacturing term is finished goods. None of us are finished goods. We are all works in progress. And in an assembly line, sometimes there's rework. We've all been through the rework thing a couple of times, no doubt. We're That's part of the work that's being done. <laughs> Get, shine that up real good. <laughs> but we're not finished goods yet. The Lord who has saved us is not done without what he has in mind in us and through us. But he started it, and therefore he is going to finish it. Because he said so. God finishes everything that he starts. There is a finish line. Can you see it? Seems like it's getting closer, though. Verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Paul, again, is encouraging the church at Philippi. He's encouraging us to follow him following Jesus. See, 14 out of the 27 books in what we call the New Testament, the Greek scriptures, were given by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul, who faithfully recorded them. The, the author is the Holy Spirit. The author is not the Apostle Paul. He was the faithful servant who recorded them. Uh, and he lived them. That which he received, he lived. He followed Jesus. And he's encouraging them, he's encouraging us to imitate him, imitate Christ. We'd be co-imitators, if you will, with Paul. To the Corinthian church, he said, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. But then he would say a couple chapters later, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. He was following Christ. He wasn't trying to draw a crowd unto himself away from Jesus. He was following Jesus. He was pointing people to Jesus. Follow me, I'm following Jesus. But to the Ephesian church, he would say, Be ye therefore followers of of God as dear children. Paul was a great example. Was he perfect? No. Do you know people in your lives who are good examples? Do you compare yourselves to them? Don't. <laughs> There's only one valid point of comparison, and that is Jesus. Look at Jesus. Follow Jesus. Listen learn and do and by receiving these words into our hearts and our minds these are the very words of God we too can follow Jesus on the narrow path that few find that leads to eternal life and we walk that path by faith and not by sight we walk that path in the spirit and not in the flesh verse 18 parenthetical thought for as many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is their destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things so not everybody who carries the name of Jesus Christ is in one accord with Jesus Christ and Paul has told them that. He's telling them that again. Uh, in verse 2 of this chapter even, he said, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Beware, there are teachers of a gospel that is works-based. You earn your salvation. That's a false gospel. There are those who teach a prosperity gospel, which is essentially worshiping of mammon. It's a lie. There is a social gospel that embraces all things woke and inclusion and psychology. It's a false gospel. There's a love gospel that says God loves everybody. And everybody's going to heaven. And hell isn't a real place. So don't worry about it. 
It's a lie. There is such a thing as crossless Christianity, whereby you don't need to repent. There's no need to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Jesus. There is such a thing as, well, there's, who knows? There, there's so many other carnal, ear-tickling teachings in the church. Not everyone who carries the name of Jesus Christ is following Jesus Christ. They're following themselves, and Paul refers to the Holy Spirit through Paul here refers to them as the enemies of the cross. What is the cross? It is the living God's one and only plan of redemption for fallen man. It is plan A, and there's no plan B or C or D. It's the plan, singular, exclusive. At the cross, that was the Father's sin sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. And that was Jesus as the Father's sacrifice, the sin bearer, our substitute. And because he had the power to lay his life down, he had the power to take it up again, and he did, he is our champion. The enemies of the cross exalt mankind as God. They glorify the flesh. The, the concept, the teaching that people are basically good. Because I don't want to be accountable to God. I'm good. I'm good enough. I don't want to change. Uh, the sentiment that God made me this way. No, that's just a way to justify your sin, to justify your choice. And those who hold those things are deceived. They have a self-centered pride that really, that that which they're proud about, is really shameful from God's point of view. We're a month, or excuse me, we're a day removed. No, we're not. We are a week. <laughs> I'll get my time frame sooner or later. We're a week removed from a month whereby perversion is proudly displayed and celebrated in this country, and it's crammed down everybody's throat. Their pride is really their shame. Does all Christianity reject the pride? Or do parts embrace the pride? It's being embraced to be inclusive. No truth. And the enemies of the cross, what is their end? Destruction. Unless they repent, it's destruction. They're on the Broadway that many find that are on the way to destruction. That's not God's will. That's not God's desire for them. That's why he sent his son to the cross to bear those sins. To be reconciled to the living God. Those who are so deceived, they must fall at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ confess their sin, repent of their sin, and call on the name of the Lord to save them from their sin. There they must be born again of the Spirit of God. That is God's will. That is God's desire. That is God's invitation. Through whom does God deliver the invitations? That would be us. That would be us. Verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it should be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The corrupt influence of the enemies of the cross that are in the church are to be avoided by those who are in Christ. Because the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, which is in the world, but not of the world, are citizens of heaven and strangers and pilgrims upon the earth. Uh, turn to the right, to the next book, 
chapter 3 of Colossians, which was the previous book that we had studied. Colossians chapter 3, starting verse 1. If he be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We're in Christ. We're of God. We're not of the world. And for a while, he has us in the world for the very purpose of drawing people with his love and his his hope and his encouragement to the cross of Christ where they might find the forgiveness for their sins as was Paul's plan uh, God's plan and purpose for the Apostle Paul Uh, the torch has been passed the baton has been passed Uh, it's not ours also when Israel um, left Mount Sinai after about 13 months stay there uh, they went on their journey and they came across a king named Barak, Balak, who hired a mercenary prophet named Balaam to curse them. And they went up on high and they saw the camp of Israel. And from Numbers chapter 2, what did they see? They saw a cross with the presence of God, the tabernacle in the middle. And Balaam said that the people, in chapter 23, verse 9 of Numbers, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. The children of Jacob, the nation of Israel, is not one of the nations. They are the Lord's inheritance. They are his. When did they get in trouble? Every time they wanted to be like one of the nations. They were called to be holy. They were called to be separate. Separate from all the other nations. Separate unto God. They didn't want that. They wanted to be just like everybody else. They still do. And that's still being worked. But we're grafted into Israel and that can be spoken of us. We're not to be reckoned among the nations because in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 Verses 17 and 18, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We are the body of Christ. We are a holy nation as the bride of Christ. And we're told in... Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our conversation is in heaven. The English word, or excuse me, the Greek word means citizenship. We who are in Christ, we have another passport. It's a heavenly passport. It's valid in heaven. It's valid in the kingdom of God on earth. It's valid in the new heaven and in the, in the new earth and forever. How was that passport purchased and secured? By the blood of Christ shed on the cross for sinners. So today, in every day that we're given, we don't know how many days we're given. Uh, let's just look at what we have today. Today, uh, again... Looking at the text, let's not look in the rear view mirror wherein only failure resides, but let's press forward in God's plan and purpose for our life until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, either on the individual basis or on a group basis. Either way, we are Gentiles. We turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he has raised from the dead Jesus who has delivered us from the wrath to come the coming of Jesus is our blessed hope 
Titus chapter 2, starting verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. There's a finish line. There's a prize at the finish line. Our vile body, and vile means low life. Have you ever thought of yourself as a low life? (laughs) Apart from Jesus, how does God look at us? The low life. Our low life body is going to be transformed, transfigured perhaps. It's going to be changed in an outward form and appearance uh, to a glorified body. We're told in scripture, which is a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. It's a spiritual body like Jesus's. It's immortal and it's incorruptible. That's the prize. But right now, until we get there, we still have dual citizenship. We are citizens of an unholy nation on the earth, and we are citizens of a holy nation in heaven. And our mission is not to save the nation. Our mission is not to save the world. Our mission is to invite people to come out of the darkness into the light to come out of the world into the kingdom of God. We, this past week, celebrated the 240th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. What's one of the foundational documents of the Declaration of Independence? The Bible. The Bible. So, this nation, with with the Bible as a foundational document, in many ways now, is a dumpster fire. We have seen a steady decline in Judeo-Christian values since the 1960s that I can recall. So what's happening? Well, God knows. And God tells us what he's doing. So we know what's happening by the word of God. And as it provides some historical context and encouragement for citizenship in heaven, let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at Job chapter 12. Perhaps the first written word. Job chapter 12. And it's a tough book to read. Got to sort out what is true and what is false. Job chapter 12. Job is speaking. Starting verse 21. He, the Lord, God Almighty, poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He increases the nations and destroyeth them. He enlarges the nations and straighteneth them again, reduces them again. In chapter 14, verse 5, Job is still speaking of man. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, speaking to God, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. God has established boundaries in time and in space for people and for nations. The Apostle Paul himself, Mars Hill in Athens, talking to all the philosophers who wanted to know what he was talking about, in Acts chapter 17 said, of, of the one true living God, he has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. All the Gentile nations 
are given boundaries from God in time and in space. And remember, Israel is not one of, not to be counted one of the nations. Therefore, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9, when the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. The boundaries in time and space for all the nations directly tied to Israel, the most important nation. Therefore, with that, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, an image. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is going to proclaim the dream and its interpretation. Let's look. Well, let's start in verse 20. Dan, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the way. He's the God of Israel. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that no understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. He sets up kings. He takes down kings. Sliding down to verse 40, same chapter. This image, and, and there's four kingdoms. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. As it relates to Israel, the fourth kingdom, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes and part of the potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were of part were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou hast sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain in the interpretation thereof sure." Four kingdoms as it relates to the nation of Israel. And then in Daniel chapter 4, pride got the better of Nebuchadnezzar. He saw another image. This time it was all gold and it was all him and it was all about him. And he was turned into a beast for a reason. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17 this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the, and the demand by the word of holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Then, in the same vein, but this time Daniel's dream, in Daniel chapter 7, the same four nations, kingdoms, as it relates to the nation of Israel, Daniel chapter 7, starting verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, 
and they brought him near before him. Of course, we're seeing God the Father, we're seeing God the Son. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and in the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto the one of them, and it goes on from there. At the end of the fourth kingdom of earth, as it relates kingdom of men, as it relates to Israel, there's another kingdom. Whose kingdom? Jesus' kingdom. We live in the days of Noah. We live in the days like the days of Lot. We live in the days of great deception. We do, in fact, live in the last of the last days. So as we consider the nation in which we live, according to the word of God, what is happening? Well, we're seeing the demise of the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire in its iron mixed with clay stage which in the course of history can be restated as Western civilization. And the American empire is the latest and the greatest of those lesser empires. This week, the Brazilian president, whose politics are way on the left, he said the U.S. election is important for the whole world. This is after the debate. He said the U.S. election is important for the whole world. And there's echoes of agreement coming out of of Europe. We're seeing the demise of the American empire before what? The kingdom of God is established on earth. When the king of kings and the lord of lords leaves heaven, comes to earth with his armies to destroy his enemies and to set up his kingdom and to reign for a thousand years and then forever that's where we are in time so does that mean our dual citizenship is contrary that the citizenship in the United States is contrary to the citizenship in heaven no they just have to be prioritized the most important the primary citizenship is what citizenship in heaven It is the most important citizenship we have. Our American, or perhaps in some cases, Mexican citizenship is secondary. But what does the word of God tell us to do in these nations? Be good citizens. Be orderly. Be law-abiding. Participate in the the goings-on. Especially as ambassadors of Christ to those in that nation whose hope is in man and not in Jesus. So, when we consider our worldview, when we consider the fact that heaven and earth are going to pass, but Jesus' words are never going to pass, when we consider the woe in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, woe unto them who call good evil and evil good, who call light darkness and darkness light, we can see that The nation we love is unraveling. But be of good courage. Fear not. Pray and rejoice in the Lord. Fight the good fight of faith. The battle is spiritual because the solution is spiritual. All nations, all languages, all tongues are going to serve Jesus. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of the United States of America? Yes. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all the earth. Does the United States acknowledge him as such? And therein lies the problem. And it's a spiritual problem. Therefore, the battle is spiritual. Therefore, the warriors are... Spiritual, that's us. Let's be laser focused in these days in which we've been been appointed to live. Forget about the things that are in the past. Reach forward to the things that are before. Be focused on the, the goal 
of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Fight the good fight of faith. Pursue with energy God's plan and purpose for your life. There is a finish line. And be a model citizen of the kingdom of heaven in order to be a model citizen in the United States. I'm reminded of a song again. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. No turning back. So if you want to march forward in one accord, please stand. Father, your word is given to us for edification and encouragement and comfort, and it always does that. When we look around, we get discouraged, we get overwhelmed. But when we look into your word, and we hear your voice speaking to us, we are comforted, and we are encouraged, and we are built up. And by your word, we do understand the times in which we have been appointed to live. And they're momentous times. Why have you appointed us to live now? That's an unanswerable question. The fact is that you have. And to be ambassadors for Christ, we need your help. Please fill us with your spirit. And as we go forth into our homes and to our neighborhoods and to our workplaces and to the grocery stores, May we remember, first and foremost, we are citizens of heaven. May we be faithful to be a good ambassador. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.